scientists from Harvard taught people who never played piano a simple five finger combination on the piano. Simple, they went plunk, 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 And they did that for two hours, Monday to Friday. It's really boring. Plunk, 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 plunk. At the start, scientists took brain scans and looked at the brain maps for each of the for, for some of the finger muscles, and they found that the Monday was that size, but the Tuesday was that size, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and the brain map for all these muscles had increased in size, which you would expect. Another group of people, instead of doing plunk, 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 guess what they did? They imagined it. So they sat in a room for two hours, Monday, <laughs> Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and went plunk, 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 plunk in their minds. Plunk, 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 plunk. Scientists took the brain scans, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You couldn't tell the difference between whether they'd actually gone plunk, 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 or just imagined it. I have a copy of, a, a photocopy from, a, a, from the actual scientific publication in the house, and I cannot tell the difference between the people who did that and the people who imagined it. The brain changes are exactly the same. I actually got a set of slides I use if I'm giving a, a big lecture with a overheads and all that. And I compare the two and you, no one can tell the difference between plunk, 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 plunk and imagining plunk, 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 plunk. But what's amazing is the actual finger muscles are stimulated and grow stronger as well just through imagining it. And we know that because another scientific study, very similar, they asked people for 15 minutes a day, five days a week for 12 weeks to do that, <laughs> to flex their little finger. Right? Very boring study. People get paid well for scientific studies sometimes. When I was a scientist in the pharmaceutical industry, one of my friends, one of the guys that was working in my team, he had to take medication every day, and every Wednesday he had to go to the medical centre and test for toxicity, and they put this thing in his stomach and scraped his stomach lining. <laughs> but he came into the bar one Thursday night, the study was finished, and he said, drugs are on me! And he got paid £2,500 for it. <laughs> <laughs> so some people get paid, I hope they get paid well for doing that, because that is a boring study. But anyway, they did that for 15 minutes a day. Well, in fact, because it's quite tiring, you do 15 seconds on, and then you get 20 seconds rest. 15 seconds on, 20 seconds rest. So they did this for 15 minutes a day, five days a week for 12 weeks. Scientists measured muscle strength before and after, and they found that the strength of the finger muscle that increased by 53%. Another group of people, instead of doing that, guess what they did? They imagined it. So another room they're sitting going, as if they're doing their finger like that. For 15 minutes a day, five days a week for three months, and their finger strength increased by 35%, and they hadn't even lifted a finger. <laughs> so if you don't want to go to the gym, there you go. <laughs> if you want to lie in your bed, watching the telly, just imagine you're, you're on the cycle machine like that. And then a wee bit of the cross trainer, like that. But in your bed, you're lying in your bed going like that, watching the telly, but your mind is just drifting out the cross trainer like that. There's evidence to suggest you're actually getting some benefit. It sounds daft, but you really are getting benefit from doing that. It's incredible. But here's the, here's the catch. If you go to the gym for half an hour, then you have to do the same time in your mind. That's where the piano study, two hours here, two hours imagining. 15, 15 minutes a day, 15 minutes imagining. So if you're going to go to the gym for half an hour, but you want to lie in your bed for half an hour, you've got to do it in your mind for half an hour. So you might as well just go to the gym. <laughs> but if you really can't be bored, if you've had you know, an accident and you can't get to the gym, there is a lot to be said about actual exercising a routine in your mind. Studies have actually shown expert rowers, who are not even rowing, but just imagining it, the heart rate actually increases. The heart is actually getting a workout from imagining rowing. Isn't that incredible? Speed skaters who are not actually speed skaters, but just imagining going around the thing, their heart is actually getting stimulated, so are their muscles, incredibly. And they're just doing it in their minds. Such is the power of the mind to affect the body. It's amazing, isn't it? But this has now been applied to rehabilitation for stroke, people who've had a stroke, or <coughs> spinal cord damage, or Parkinson's disease, for the main areas. Just because you can increase the strength of the muscle by doing that, what if a person had an impaired movement in one side of the body through a stroke? Wouldn't the same principle apply? Absolutely. Scientists did studies with people who've had a stroke. Half of them were given the normal six-week course of physiotherapy. The other half were given the normal physiotherapy, but in addition, they were asked to, to visualise. Scientists don't like to use the term visualisation, so they call it mental imagery or motor imagery. Right? Yeah. Just, you know, visualisation. <laughs> right? so, so what they had to do is just visualise using that part of the body. So if the left arm was impaired, 
they just visualize simple things like you know eating an apple but imagining the movements of the of these muscles or drinking a cup of coffee but the imagined movements were enough to stimulate the part of the brain that governs those muscles, which sends an electrical charge down there. In the same way that you increase muscle strength by 35% through imagination, the muscle strength begins to come back. And the people who visualized got much, much more improvement during that six-week period than the people who didn't. And they did exactly the same thing for people with spinal cord injuries. People who visualized improved much, much faster. And for Parkinson's disease patients, they improved much, much faster through visualising, and they also improved in their ability to point to a specific target, their accuracy. You know, when you shake with Parkinson's, you point to a specific place. They could do it faster and much more accurate through visualisation. One of the reasons we, we've invest, uh, scientists have investigated placebo, uh, Parkinson with a placebo effect, and if you just tell people, Parkinson's responds really high to placebo, a very high placebo effect for Parkinson's. And what they've actually found is, if a person thinks they're getting an anti-Parkinson's drug, but it's really just a placebo, not only do the tremors go down, but the brain actually produces dopamine, which is a chemical that's deficient in people with Parkinson's. But the mind has this ability to produce dopamine. So through this visualization process, I'm convinced that the brain is actually producing dopamine in the parts called the striatum of the brain that releases dopamine into the motor area, which stimulates the muscles. So through that visualization process, not only we're stimulating the parts of the body, but we're actually changing the chemical nature of the brain. And because we're visualizing, <coughs> as they found in the stroke cases, some of the damaged area of the brain began to regenerate. Isn't that extraordinary? Mm -hmm. yeah, just through Im imagination. So, and I mentioned that if you put your attention in a particular part of the body, that's what's affected. Visualizing there built up that muscle. It didn't build up the muscles in the legs. It only built up there. So why is it that the brain is only stimulated in the bit of the body that we put our attention on? University of Turin neuroscientists did a great experiment where they took, you know chili peppers? Right? You know they burn? Mm -hmm. I know that because last night we made a, a nice meal and I decided to buy some green chilies and I thought I'd wash my hands properly. Two hours later I was scratching my eye. Oh, I couldn't, I was like that for about 20 minutes. It was so painful. The chemical that does that is called capsaicin. Right? Scientists at the University of Turin School of Medicine took capsaicin out of chili peppers and they injected them into the hands and feet of a group of volunteers. Right? They must have been paid well. <laughs> <laughs> and each person had to monitor their level of pain. Right? So you monitor your level of pain. If you had capsaicin injected, I know from last night, on a scale not to 10, it's pretty close to 10. Right? <laughs> really, really so. But with some of the people, they were given an injection, uh, sorry, they were given a, a cream a, a, an analgesic cream, or an anaesthetic cream to rub on, so an anaesthetic cream. Some people were giving it to rub on here, other people here and here, right? So different parts of the body. And then capsaicin was injected. So if, cap if the cream was given on there, then the capsaicin was injected, pain level 10, 10, 10, 1 or 2. Way down in that part, but nowhere else. Because that's where you expected there to be pain relief, even though it was a placebo. Your mind was on there, you expected pain relief there. The part of the brain that produces, that affects, the part of the brain that governs that, those nerves there, that part of the brain is stimulated and not any other part. And when they looked into the actual chemistry of the brain, they found that those endogenous opioids, the natural versions of morphine, were released in the part of the brain only for that hand, not for anywhere else. So we were actually targeting specific things in the body. Wherever we placed our attention and expected something to happen, that's what's happened. The same would happen if a person with an ulcer who also had asthma were given a placebo for the ulcer and told this is a, the best anti-ulcer drug in the world, your ulcer will disappear within about three or four weeks. And they took it every day, then you'd find after four weeks the ulcer would probably go away.